Hello everyone, how are you all doing on this fine week? Of course it's January. We're in the grim period of the year everyone, but thankfully we are working through it, we're getting through it. We are working through this grimness. Let's turn that down a bit. Of course you're listening to the World of Trash podcast with me, Stevie. I am your host. We're looking through the world of British current affairs and just things that just interest me. I like interesting topics. Topics we can really get our teeth into. Whether it's government, corruption, idiots in power, propaganda, or today, UFOs. Yep, I'm going there. I'm doing a podcast about UFOs. It's going to be cool, hopefully. (laughs) This is actually a complete gamble. So, the theme for today's show is that I have found some files on the CIA website and I'm going to read them. But before I go into that, let's do the bit that I'm supposed to do, which is my plugs. You can, of course, subscribe to the podcast. You can find this on iTunes. You're already listening, so you've half the battle's done. Just make sure you keep coming back and listening. That'd be great. You can follow me on Twitter, at Stevie C. Smith. I love Twitter banter, so if you want to come at me with anything, come at me! If you want to chat politics, chat Brexit, chat anything, hit me up on Twitter. As I said, at Stevie C. Smith. And I will reply, because as I said, I'm a bit of a Twitter junkie. I cannot deny that. At the moment, I need your help, people. If you're listening to this, then I don't know, you maybe don't know, I've made videos in the past. I've had a YouTube channel that I put a lot of work into. But I never really focused on trying to get subscribers or anything like that. Until today. YouTube has changed the rules on monetization. Now, it's not about money because I don't make anything from the channel. This is about popping up in search. Full searches on YouTube. If your monetization is removed, that means you've got less chance of your video being seen by people because there's no adverts on it and YouTube don't want people watching videos that don't have adverts because they don't make money from that click. So please, I'm going to put a link in the description, in the information bit, whatever you want to call it. Please subscribe to my channel. I literally just need 1,000 subscribers and I've already got 500, so I'm halfway there. And what I'm going to do is I'll start uploading these shows to my... YouTube channel. At the moment, they've been syndicating through the World Trash channel, which is all good, but no one sees that. So I will make sure that they get uploaded to the Imagine Stevie channel, which is my channel that's got all my best stuff on it. And I'll be uploading the documentary I made in December, Hidden Underground. Um, I'll also upload some more things that I've been working on, mainly based around politics and stuff. But yeah, please send me your energy. Give me a subscription. That would be so awesome. And, of course, if you want to help support the podcast, because I do this for free. It's free, but, but things have got to be paid for. So, I've got t-shirts. I've got stickers. You can head on over to my Redbubble site. Literally, one t-shirt pays for everything for a month. <laughs> it's that cool. So, one t-shirt or even just a few stickers. It helps me keep this up and running with no stress so I can do this work on gaining my media degree and hopefully one day do this professionally and get paid and give you all the information that has been hidden from the media or hidden from the internet which is what brings me around to today's topic as I said we are doing UFOs so where am I getting my information for UFOs you may ask Stevie Where's this information coming from? Why are you talking about UFOs? Is this a conspiracy podcast? Well, no, it is not a conspiracy podcast. This just interests me. So, in December, when I initially meant to record this, I was just doing my usual, wasting time, procrastinating on the internet. And I found out that the CIA uploaded loads of files about UFOs from their archives. 
awesome, I thought. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go and look at that. I've never seen these. So I went to the CIA website. And to my dismay, they were gone. All gone. You could not view them. They're not there to be seen. So I was thinking, what the hell? Where have they gone? Why have they taken them down? That's poor show, CIA. What's, who would have thought the CIA would try and hide things? But me, being who I am, the tenacious little bugger, I was like, you know what? I'm not taking this line down. I want to see these damn files. So here's a trick for you all, right? If you go on a website and a file's disappeared or a page is not found, go to a site called Wayback Engine. And what that'll do is that'll show you historical versions of the site. Or you can just use Google to do the same sort of thing. If you put, if a page is gone from the internet and you know the page it's linked from, you can put that page link into Google. I'll try and keep this tech free. Put the link into Google and search for the link. Now, when Google finds it, you'll notice that to the right of it, there'll be a little link. And the little link will say, cached version. Do you want to ver view the cached version of the page? And this is what you should do. So what I had done was I put the link for the page where all these files were gone from. And I looked at the cached version. And wouldn't you believe, not only did the links pop up, but it actually gave me access to the files. So the files were still on the CIA servers, and they still are now. They're just hidden because they've removed the main page. Awesome, I thought. So I downloaded a load of them. And for today's show, I have picked four of these documents completely at random. Now, I've not read these yet, anything like that. I'm totally winging it. This is a ma this is a massive gamble. This could go really wrong, or it could be cool. I mean, I'm gonna have to read, so bear with me, because Stevie, the king of dyslexia, is gonna have to read. <laughs> so this could be painful for me, but otherwise entertaining. So yeah, I've got these four documents that I've procured from the CIA's website. So they are hidden. This is like the name is not a clickbait name. These files are hidden on the CIA's website. They don't want people to see them, but you can if you've got the tenaciousness and ability to get around their silly web systems. So we're going to have a little read through them. We're just going to have a little look at them. We're going to read through them and we'll have a little chat about them. But I mean, the UFO topic, before I get to that, it's a topic I've always thought is really cool. I love the, th I love the thought that there's UFOs, that we're not alone. That I mean, to think there's nothing else in the universe it's just supremely arrogant, I always think. It's just like, man, Earth is not the centre of the universe. And the universe is, like, infinitely big. It's finite in size, but it's infinitely growing. So there's no way that we're the only things on this Earth, on the, in this universe that has got a bit of brains and some intelligence. I'm not buying that. Whether they come to Earth now is a different story. Like Roswell, for instance. I don't think... UFOs came to Roswell. I think that's just bunk. But you never know. I mean, for years, I thought all the stories about these high-class, high-level paedophile rings within the BBC and stuff like that, I mean, those rumours were going about for decades, and no one believed them. I didn't believe them, but then they came true. Other things have came true, so... You never know. Roswell maybe did happen, but I don't think it happened. I think if UFOs have ever came to Earth, it's most likely at a time before our history began and or at the very start of human history like when the mayans were on the go and all that sort of stuff and that really really old time period and the egyptians they've all got in their paintings and in their media they created back then they've got they've always depicted beings coming from the sky and things like that i mean look at the the concept of god it's a big thing that lives in the sky everywhere where did these ideas come from? Where did the idea of things coming from the sky come from? That is what interests me in UFOs. So it's like, well, what planted the seed that there can be things flying in the air with sentient beings, in it? You get what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? I'm leaving a bit of air there. A little bit of space, should I say. With a bit of hope someone's thinking and they're like, yeah, 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 he's not insane. He's not, he's not mental. Stevie, you're totally not mental. So anyway... Let us have a look at these files. The first file we're going to look at is says a German scientist's something Ger a German German scientist article on flying discs. So this was by a doctor, Edward Ludwig, from Santiago, Chile. 
It's got his address and everything, eh? And this was in 1916, I believe. Could that be right? Is that that? That's maybe part of the address. Ignore the 1916. I think that's a postcode. <laughs> so anyway, it is titled "The Mystery of the Quote Unquote Flying Discs: A Contribution to Its Possible Explanation." So let's read into this. Through the continuously reappearing reports on the appearance of new mysterious aircraft of unknown construction should be considered with severe scepticism as the result of a sort of mass hypnosis. Nevertheless, some of the detailed and con conciding accounts of technically trained observers deserve attention and permit one to draw conclusions as to the probable classification of these new aircrafts. Interesting. So, here's a doctor flat out saying that this is what you would know as like a psyop, like pop, like um, perception control, perception management. He's saying it's a sort of well, people are being trolled, but on a mass level to believe that these UFOs exist, and that's quite interesting because I was watching an Adam Curtis documentary as I do a lot, and he talks about this as well about how. They, like, it's a really hard concept to try and get around. People thought that they seen UFOs. So the US government, like CIA types, went to these people and they got these people to report they were seeing things and they were the witnesses and they were the people that seen the UFOs. But they were actually shills. They were saying that to plant the seed. So I can see what they're saying here. They're saying that someone is trying to make people believe that flying off flying saucers are a thing and they've seen it. Interesting, but this goes on. Since so far the observations have been made mainly in the dark, which means the only luminous parts of the aircraft are visible, every report brings the description of shining disks or circles. If one should discard the absurd conjecture that these aircraft originate from beyond the Earth, then it is easy to arrive at the conclusion that the shining circles bear a relation to the What's that say? Exhaust of a rotary gas turbine. The possibility exists that the rotor of a turbine is used at the same time as a stabilising top, which is therefore fixed vertically to the level of the other turbine rings, which in darkness produces the effect of the rings of Saturn. So he, I think he's trying to say that this is a rotary gas turbine engine that's sitting horizontally in the middle of this thing? interesting. These observations remind me of a completely new type of aircraft which was developed during the years I worked in the research plant of Professor Junkers in Dasso. Dosu? D-O-S-S-A-U. I've never heard of that town before. Which was attached to the airplane factories known all over the world. I do not know how many of my co-workers are still alive today, but I do know that Dr. Bock professor at the Technical High School of Berlin, who was at that time my chief and friend for many years, has been deported to the Soviet Union. Oh! Hmm! Oh, hit the mic. So I'm going to read one more. There's only a little bit more to go on this, so let's get this done. The name of Professor Brock... Prof professor Bock, B-O-C-K, was never widely known due to his modest character, but he may have been the greatest genius, genius of German airplane theoretics, and later, in view of his extraordinary faculties, he was named head constructor of the Ministry of German Airways and the director of the German Institute of Airway Research in Berlin, Adershof. Aldershof. So this is actually, like, so, what's the guy's name again? Dr. Ludwig. He seems to be insinuating that Professor Bock has been deported to the USSR, to the Soviet Union. The Professor Bock is like the top airplane construction type person they had there. He's now in the Soviets and potentially working on this new aircraft. So, I mean, Ludwig, he really strongly thinks that this is a... This is from Earth. It's an Earth-made thing. He doesn't. He totally discounts UFOs on this. He doesn't say. And this fits in what I think about UFOs. I think 
99.999% of them are just things being confused or they're things being tested by militaries and people that build airplanes and stuff like that. So I'll just finish off the last little bits because I don't want to read this all. In order to explain a wider circle of readers the basic idea of the new aircraft, I should like to submit the first of the following explanations. So, I'm not going to go into the explanations. I'm going to skip that bit. Let's see, let's go down to the last paragraph. See if there's anything juicy there. The logical conclusions based on these theoretic discoveries were obvious. Already in the year 1915, Professor H.C. Bauman also from the Technical High School of Stuttgart, received a patent on the split wing through which the artificial interruption of the course of current, the tailing of the boundary... Sorry, it's the printing on this is it's like a scan of a printed document from 1915 or whatever. It's really, really bad to read sometimes. It's all blurry and stuff. But yeah, that's... So this is on the CIA's record. I mean, it goes on and on and on. I mean, I'm, I think we've got all we need from this document. A UFO was seen, or UFOs have been seen, and Dr. Ludwig is convinced that this is just a Soviet psyop of trying to com trying to put people in a state of mass hypnosis for whatever reason. I've got no idea why they would have done that. I mean, this is a really early report it's saying that a lot of this stuff happened. Like, right, it is. I was right before it was 1916 that this article was written. So that's pre, that's like around World War One time. I mean, I heard of like UFOs being made by governments around about World War Two and the such, but to have it at 1915, that's really, really early. And it's quite interesting that they say, they insinuate the Soviet psyops and that sort of stuff. So, interesting read that one. That was a very interesting read. Basically, UFOs are terrestrial, is what we get from the first one. So the second document we're going to look through is called Flying Saucers. This is an office memorandum of the United States government dated 15th of March 1949. It was to a Dr. Michelle from Dr. Stone OSI. And the subject is Flying Saucers. So this guy wrote a list and he's also sketched a diagram with a tra trajectory which is interesting. Oh, no, no, this un no, this is a graph with number of sightings. Ooh, this looks like we've got some juicy information in this one. Let's get to it. So, number one, a rapid pursuit of your documents leaves one confused and inclined to suppiness. I've never heard that word before. Two, the following considerations. I just tripped over that word so painfully. The following considerations seem not to have been included in the survey. A. No suggestion is noted that there is a possibility that many of the objects may be free meteor me meteor meteorological. Why can I not speak today? What the hell's happening? <laughs> Met meteorological. I like love watching weather. I can normally say this word super easy, but basically weather balloons. No suggestion has been made that it is weather balloons. B. If a tame, it says tame here, I don't know why. If a tame flying saucer is to be involved, it is extremely unlikely they be found over US because, and there's, oh, so here we go, A, 1. US developments would be closely coordinated with the US Air Force or commercial designers. 2. Foreign aircraft development would hardly be tested at such a range from home areas, even if fuel could be supplied. 3. Guided aircraft at a range of several thousand miles are beyond any known capability, including ours. So that's reasons why this guy thinks that they're not... That they shouldn't be found over the US because no one's got that much fuel. That's a pretty, that's a pretty muted, uh, whoops, pretty tunnel-visioned view on that situation there. Myopic. What is the psychological probability that any object seen briefly against zero background will be circular or oval in appearance? It's a very good point. If you look at, even in a plane, if a plane's far away, you'll just see a blob. No matter what shape it is. And lastly, he says, or he asks, has anyone commented on the curious time distribution of the observations? So, 
we have got a graph here, and we've got up the right, up the left hand side, we've got the numbers 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, and that represents the number of sightings. Along the bottom, we've got months. It goes from December to January. So if you look at this little chart, we can see that from December that year to May that year, there's everything's under five. It looks like there's maybe one or two sightings per month. Then in June, July, it shot, rocketed right up to around about 2025. And by July, it is literally off the chart. It is past 30 sightings. And it is, and then it just comes down a little bit in August. Back By August, it goes back down to 10 sightings. And then it kind of sits around there before coming to December, January, where it starts going up again to 25 sightings per month. Interesting. So it seems like there was a, the summer, there was a definite thing that happened between May and September of that year. Something definitely happened. I mean, there was an event. You can see it on just with the amount of sightings that was seen. <laughs> Is there any Midsummer Madness involved? Any asteroids prominent in that season? Now, that is a very good question because that is something I constantly think is reported and people see big meteors, meteorites and big fireballs coming from the sky and they think it's a UFO, but it's not as natural. So, um, let's have a look. Me meteor showers, summer. Let's see what meteor showers we can get in summer in the USA. So I am going to think it's probably the Perseids. Because the Perseids are one of the bigger meteor showers you get. And they happen each year between July and August. <laughs> so, like, and of course, that's July and August when the peak obviously start a little bit before and a little bit after. But the peak tends to be around about August. Of course, this changes every year. So, it's quite possible that the reports here that this... Um, what was his name again? Back to the top. Back to the top. The report from Dr. Stone, OSI. I think he's probably right here. Because what's happened is there's a massive bump in the summer right around Perseid season. Um, let's see if there was a big, shower, a big shower in 1949. 1949. Oh, I don't know if we can get records in this. It's a long shot Google in this, so... Hmm. Perseid Spectrum. See, this may be something to research. Something to research. I'm going to stop the research there because we've only got... We don't have that much time. I'm trying to keep this to a short form now. But yeah, I'm going to say Flying Saucers, Dr. Stone. He is bang on, right? I think it was Perseids. That's it. It was the Perseid Meteor Shower. And on the topic of Meteor Showers, right? Meteor Showers are one of my most... One of the things I like most about the sky, and one of the things I like doing most on a nice clear night, is looking for meteorites, looking for satellites. But it's a gamble. I have sat outside for hours at a time and not seen one. I've been walking the dog and seen two. It happens. But when you see a meteorite in the sky, it's always it's always an event. I think the biggest one I've ever seen was when I stayed, I used to stay in Blackpool. It's down in England, for anyone that doesn't know where Blackpool is. So I stayed in Blackpool and I was walking the dog one night, and I just looked over... And there was the biggest green fireball in the sky. This thing was huge. And it wasn't just me that seen it. I heard like there was a park down the road. I just heard like as soon as it came into vision, loads of like, ah, what the hell's that? What the hell's that? People were going mental. And it just like came right over the sky and disappeared over the horizon. I was like, that's crashed somewhere. Like, nope, apparently it continued. And um, I mean, that was, oh, when was that? maybe 12 years ago, 10 years ago, something like that, 12 years ago. So it was before everyone had really good smartphones who could just whip the camera out and start filming in a split second. We didn't have any of that. So, I mean, at the time, I looked for reports on other forums, mainly the Above Top Secret Forum, which is like for conspiracies and all that sort of meteorite alternative theory type stuff. And there was people there seeing it. People thought it might have been a rocket engine. I don't care what it was. It could have been it could have been a frozen dog that fell out of one of them Russian rockets for all I care. It would be a shame for the dog, but it was a really good light show. That's a maybe a strange way to put it. I'm not gonna use that analogy again. <laughs> that was a disgusting analogy. I don't know where that came from. 
let us get on to the... I'm just going to... I think I'll do this one last because I'm wanting to try and keep this to about half an hour. So, the last one. It's called Light Phenomena. Do not circulate. This was reported May to, Decem May to September 1947. At the top, there's a big... Loads of redactions on this. This is unevaluated information. Source. Second interrogation. So someone, this has came from an interrogation, this. I am, who were they interrogating? I'm imagining, I'm going to guess it was someone from Russia, since they seem to think that it was a Russian psy or someone. People thought it was a Russian psy op. So let's get into this. There's, um, how much paragraphs do we have in this one? We've got three paragraphs and a little bit at the end. Is there anything else? Oh, and we've got a diagram. The diagram looks exactly like the fireball I just talked about, so... We will see what it says. So let's get this started. Second interrogation. Number one. During the period of May to September 1947, three light phenomena happening at intervals of about 15 minutes were seen almost every night between 9 and 10 p.m. local time. <gasps> it's a satellite. <laughs> the phenomena were watched from the P7 camp in Pukta, Aral, more towns I've never heard of, about 50 kilometers southwest of Tashkent. They've got the things here. Uzbek SSR. In an east southeasterly direction. So, east southeasterly. So, that's going west east. Uh, I'm just doing this in my head now. So, yeah, that's west east. I'm sure that's the way satellites go as well. Satellites. Let me see what was in space in 1947. I think this is just a satellite because that is what that is the behavior that you would expect from a satellite you would see it at the same time fly especially if it was on the same sort of pattern so quickly let's have a look it says I mean that's not very helpful so who knows what it was because right here it says the first satellites Sputnik obviously and Sputnik 2 they were they were up in 1957 you had Sputnik Sputnik 2 and Vanguard so interesting let's continue a darkened ball of fire a darkened that's a dark a dark red so as i said it's very smudgy this <laughs> a dark red ball of fire was seen first after about six seconds it reached the apex of a long drawn out trajectory during this time the ball had developed a trail of fire its color which was bright red at the apex point changed in color from pale green to white smoke trails noises or detonations were not noticed so i mean it sounds like a really big fire i mean the first one when I, when it says it's a light at the same time going west east that makes me think satellite now this second bit puts that out the window because it was on fire and satellites don't tend to be on fire the distance of the trajectory was from the point of observation I'll do that again. The distance of the trajectory from the point of observation was estimated at 60 to 80 kilometers. The, tra the trajectory ran approximately from southwest to northeast. Its length to the apex, which was from 5,000 to 12,000 meters high, was estimated at about 80 kilometers. At the apex, the ball of fire seemed about one-fifth the diameter of the full moon. This is some totally crazy irrational maths they've used here i would love to know how this person has got these numbers by just looking at things in the sky you can't you can't tell like perfect example of this and you can you can track these on various websites yourself so you can see like what the deal is what happens with it and i'm talking about the international space station because you can actually see that on a nice night if it's in your area you'll normally see it twice in a couple of hours because that's how fast it goes around the earth my point is when you see iss and it's right over and overhead it just looks like an airplane it's just a it looks as low as an airplane to most people and you so like an airplane's 30 like a, like a big jet that they fly between 30 and forty thousand feet i don't know how much meters it is but that's how much it is that's nowhere near as high as iss because that's up at like 127 miles so the point is that you can't judge meters like 
distances the way this guy's this person's dodge distances is just irrational because you've got no way of telling the, how high or low a light is. If you've got a really bright light up at 200 miles and it's bigger than a normal light, then you're going to think that's lower. You're going to think that's airplane height. So it's a very, very strange mass they've used in this one. Where's my music gone? Well, apparently we don't have music now. Music stopped. Oh, here we go. So that's a, this is a strange one, this. This is a really interesting one. Field comment at the bottom. The measurements stated with respect to, to the trajectory must be received with reserve. Ha! <laughs> no shit! It must be considered that neither the discharge nor the noise developed by the projectile, projectile were heard. For trajectory of phenomena, see Annex. Washington comment. This is a re, -in a re -in Interrogation of the informant of SO 49149X. So, this information actually came from someone that was interrogated, which is pretty, pretty. I mean, it's crazy that we get to read this stuff. So, this was approved for release the 6th of March 78. And lastly, we've got the trajectory here. So, I'm looking at side on. It's side on. If I can, I'll see if I can take pictures of these and put them up along with the podcast i'll see what i can do with that but it's got the trajectory of the fireball and like i was saying before this is exactly what it's exactly the sort of trajectory i seen when i seen that fireball in blackpool it came up from the horizon overhead and disappeared over the horizon and it was really cool and it looked like this although the one i seen was bright green which i believe's called uh i'm not googling this just now i believe it's a bolide or something like that and they're green because of the metals that are inside it but i mean let's look back at this fact this one's really interesting this is asking more questions than foundation x this is this is some pretty cool stuff which i heard about foundation x yesterday for the first time blew my mind so three light phenomena that happened at intervals of 15 minutes every night between 9 and 10 p.m local time and this was in the Soviet, well, it was in Uzbek, Uzbekistan, uh, Uzbek SSR. So, could this have been the Russians just testing rockets? Because if they were testing rockets, this is exactly what would happen. And it would make sense that they would be doing it at the same time every night. Because maybe that's just their, their schedule. I mean, it's like a darkened ball of fire was seen first. Long drawn trajectory, trail of fire, bright red at apex point, change colour to pale green to white, smoke trails, none of that. There was smoke trails. No, there was no smoke trails or noises or detonations. It's a strange one. I mean, at that time, the Russians must have been testing rockets because they were getting ready to start their space race and it was like at the end of the war... Hmm. This uh, again. This is one I would not say. This is this is not aliens. None of these have been reporting aliens in any way. I don't think so. We don't have little green men coming down. There's no giant people or anything like that. It's all clandestine. Is that the right term? Governments testing things. People using the skies above us to test their wicked, wicked weapons and cool as hell technology, like massive rockets. As much damage as they do. I kind of like rockets. I would like a rocket. But that was a strange one. So I'm going to leave it there. Because that says we've done half an hour of this already. So I'm going to leave that for today. I am happy that we have finally looked at the UFO documents. And if people liked this one and they want to hear more. I've got loads more of these documents. So if you liked this show, let me know on Twitter. Come on. It's at Stevie C. Smith. Come at me on Twitter and tell me if you like this one and tell me if you want to hear more shows on the secret UFO files from the CIA, of course. And I will do it. But that's it. That's the show for today. So thank you very much for listening. Before I go, I'd like to give a big shout out to Hendrik, Baz, Jane Jane and Mark Alexander. Hendrik, Baz, Jane are part of the FBPE movement. The whole FBPE movement, everyone there, all the positive people have been great by embracing uh, the last few weeks' podcasts. Mark helped awesomely by sharing out and it 
went like for me at my level it went what i would say for viral at a small level so for that thank you very much that was awesome is i just think it's super cool because i make this just so i'm happy if one person listens and one person enjoys it and to see people engaging and liking it i just think it's really really cool and even that like it means a lot to me because i'm like well i'm glad that i gave you something to fill half an hour and it was something different to think about except for the other than the silly world we live in just now in the uk just a thought catch me on twitter and if you want to contact me via email before i go i'm really butchering today's like intros and outros here this has got to be the worst outro ever stevie and the shittest outro ever show's never going to end because i can't freaking finish it if you've got any comments and you don't want to go on twitter and you want to use email podcasts at worldoftrash.co.uk the website is worldoftrash.co.uk of course my name's stevie i will see you next time for a general election type coverage show it should be fun cheerio